Learning Module 4, Factors Influencing the Strength of Flexural Members. We'll begin by defining the geometry. Under Geometry, select Define Frame. Down at the bottom, we'll have one bay. The length of the member is 18.4 feet, but we'll be working in inches, so I'm going to multiply that by 12. Hit Apply, and the member's been defined. It's been suggested that we subdivide the member into eight elements, so let's do that. So we'll select Geometry, Subdivide Elements. We'll select the element, and down at the base we'll increase the number of segments to eight. And then we'll hit Apply. Next, let's turn off the node and element numbers. So under View, Labels, Node Numbers. And then again, View, Labels, Element Numbers. Our analysis will actually be three-dimensional, so let's get a isometric view. So under View, select Define Views, and select Isometric View. Now lateral torsional buckling is going to be one of the failure modes that we'll be looking at. Because there is twisting involved, we're going to need some additional elements so we can actually see the twisting. So let's go under Geometry and select Duplicate Node. Let's select the center node, node 6, and I'm going to define a duplication of this in the y direction of 7 inches. Hit Apply, and that node's in. I'll then repeat this, selecting node 7 again, or node 6 again, and inputting a minus 7. Hit Apply. Now I'll select these bottom and this top node, and I'll duplicate it 4 inches in the Z direction. Hit Apply. I'll then repeat the process, select the bottom node and that top node, and duplicate it minus 4 inches, and hit Apply. We'll now define some elements between those nodes. Under Geometry, select Define Element. We'll put in the elements, clicking on each node. So Start node to the End node, hit Apply. Start node to the end node and hit apply. Start node, end node, hit apply. Start node, end node, hit apply. Start node to end node, hit apply. Start node to end node, and hit apply. It should be noted that these additional nodes and elements will have no effect on our results. They'll simply ride along the rigid body motion defined by that center node in the beam. But it will allow us to see torsion, or twisting. Because there'll be a significant amount of torsion involved in this, we would like to include the warping resistance uh, to torsion that's provided by a W14 by 53. To include this warping resistance, we'll have to select Geometry, Define Connections, and Torsion. We'll select all of the beam elements, the elements making up the beam, no need to include those elements defining the eye there. So those are the eight elements making up the beam. The warping restraint will be continuous at both the start and ends of the elements. And then we'll hit apply, and the warping continuity of the section will be included in our analyses. The geometry of the beam has now been defined. Next, we'll define and attach the section of material properties. So we'll go under Properties, Define section. Instead of typing in all the values down below, we'll go to the AIC database by selecting Database, and then scrolling down on the right until we find our W14 by 53. Once we've located it, we'll click on it, and the values down at the base will be defined. We will need to hit Apply before these values will be permanently defined in Section 1. We can now go on and attach those section properties. Under Properties, select Attach Section. We'll attach that to all the elements, and then we'll hit Apply. Yes, we did attach the W14 by 53 to, to those additional six elements we provided, but they just need any properties. Again, their resistance will not be impacting the results of any of these analyses. Using a similar approach, we'll define and attach the material properties. We'll go to Properties, 
to find material. We'll type in the information down at the bottom. The name of the material will be steel. We'll provide it an E value of 29,000. And we'll provide it a yield strength of 50,000. It's also important to note that we'll leave the weight density at zero. This means the self weight of the members will not be included in any of the analysis. And then we'll hit apply and the material properties have been defined. We'll attach these properties to the elements by selecting attach material. On the bottom menu, we'll select all so that all materials are defined as steel. And then we'll hit apply. At this point, the section and material properties for all the elements have been defined. And you can see all the elements are solid, so this should not hold up the analysis. We'll now go on and define the boundary conditions, including the support conditions and the loads. So select conditions, define fixities. Down at the base, we see the six degrees of freedom for each node. By clicking on them, we can restrain them. So let's define the pin support at the left end of the member. We'll click on the X, Y, and Z displacements, so we're going to restrain those degrees of freedom. And we're also going to restrain the rotation about the X axis. This will restrain uh, the twist that the member might see at each end. So we'll select the element node, and then we'll hit apply. Using a similar approach, we'll provide a roller at the right end of the beam. First, we'll clear the list. Then we'll select the right end of the beam. And we'll release that X displacement component. We'll leave the Y, Z, and X rotation restrained. And then hit Apply. With our support conditions defined, we'll now apply the moments. Under Conditions, select Define Moments. We'll select the left end of the beam and input a moment of minus 1000. And then hit apply to define the moment. We'll define the moment at the right end by first clearing the list, then selecting the node, and then changing the value at the bottom from minus 1000 to positive 1000. Hit apply, and we have equal and opposite moments producing uniform bending. At this point, the pre-processing is complete, and we can go on and analyze the structure for the case where we do not include initial imperfections. First, we'll do the second order inelastic analysis. So we'll select analysis, second order inelastic. Now we'll need to set the analysis parameters. So we'll change the increment size to 0.01 or 1%. We'll artificially set the maximum number of increments to a large number, say 10,000. And we'll also set the maximum applied load ratio to a large number, say 100. By using this large number for the maximum number of increments and the maximum applied load ratio, we'll ensure that the analysis will run until the beam fails. Now it's important to note that the modulus in the parameters down at the bottom has been purposely left at E. This means that partial yielding or residual stresses will not be included in the analysis. We'll now hit apply and the analysis will be performed. Looking at the message next to the status window, we can see that the beam reached its limit of resistance at a load ratio of 3.72. With 1,000 inch kips a moment on the beam, we've found that the beam fails in uniform bending at 3,720 inch kips. Let's have a look at the deflected shape. Under results, select diagrams, deflected shape, and then hit apply. We can see that those end moments cause the beam to deflect in plane downward, but we do not see the lateral torsional buckling mode that occurred. We will not be able to see this with an incremental analysis unless we include some type of an imperfection. Now this analysis has not included the effects of partial yielding. So let's go back and reperform a second order inelastic analysis that includes partial yielding effects. To do this, we'll select analysis, second order inelastic. Now we're going to change that parameter next to a modulus from E to ETM. By setting this parameter to ETM, MassTan will use a modified tangent modulus approach to approximate the behavior of partial yielding. We'll now hit apply and the analysis will be performed. Looking next to the status window at the base, we can see that the beam failed at an applied load ratio of 2.8. 
Now this is significantly lower than the 3.72 we saw before. Again, this reduction is as a result of that partial yielding impacting the strength of the beam. Now we could go on and have a look at the deflected shape, but it really wouldn't show anything more than we saw earlier. Again, without the initial imperfection, we are not going to see lateral torsional buckling. Before going back and including those initial imperfections, let's do one more level of analysis, and that's an elastic critical load analysis. To do this, we'll select Analysis, Elastic Critical Load, and then hit Apply. With the elastic critical load analysis complete, let's go into Results, Diagrams, and Deflected Shape. Hit Apply. Now we can see the lateral torsional buckling included. So this eigenvalue of buckling analysis has a nice feature in which we can plot the buckling mode. In this case, it occurred at a load factor of 3.518, or 3,519 kip inches of force was on the beam in uniform bending when the beam failed by elastic lateral torsional buckling. We can see this elastic LTB by looking at the center of the beam. We can see where that I shape was. It moved in the Z direction laterally, and the I shape also twisted. So this was the advantage of including those additional elements so we could actually see the twist as well as the lateral translation. There are several ways we can change the geometry to include the initial imperfection. At this point though, the easiest way would be to just scale the deflected shape that we currently have from our elastic critical load analysis. To do this, we'll select Results and Update Geometry. We'll select the center node change the degree of freedom, so we're going to scale in the Z direction, and provide a value of the length of the beam, which was 18.4, again we're working in inches, times 12, and our imperfection will be divided by 1000. And then we'll hit apply. The base geometry of our model has now been modified to include an initial out-of-plane deformation of the length of the beam divided by a thousand. Now it's very important to note that Mass 10 2, when it updated the geometry, it also included a small amount of twist along the element lengths. Now this initial twist was not requested in the assignment, so we'll need to go back and remove it. To do this, we'll go back to geometry and select reorient elements. We'll then select all of the elements and set their beta angle back to zero. Hit apply, and those initial twists have now been removed from all of the elements. With the initial imperfection or out of straightness of L over 1000 now included in the model, we'll go back and reperform those analyses. To do this, we'll select Analysis, Second Order Inelastic. We'll change that modulus parameter down at the base back to E, and now we'll perform a second order inelastic analysis that includes initial imperfections, but does not account for partial yielding. Hit apply, and the analysis is complete. We can see that the failure applied load ratio was 3.407, or that the beam failed at a uniform moment of 3,407 inch kips. Now let's include the effects of partial yielding. So we'll change the modulus from E back to ETM. Hit apply and perform the analysis. The analysis is stopped at a load factor of 2.61, indicating that when we include both residual stresses and partial yielding as well as those initial imperfections, the beam will fail an inelastic lateral torsional buckling at uniform moment of 2610 inch kips. Let's have a look at the deflected shape. Select results, diagrams, deflected shape and then hit apply. Because the incremental analysis now included an initial imperfection, we could actually see the lateral torsional buckling occurring. You can now go back and redefine the geometry for other unbraced lengths and repeat these analyses. This concludes learning module four.